the second session of the 2022 Ohio State University Extension Beef Team's Virtual Beef School was hosted via Zoom on February 23rd. The second half of that session included a look at OSU Animal Sciences PhD candidate Kirsten Nichols' research on how performance in a cow-calf operation might be impacted by the mud we've experienced in recent winters. In this eight-minute excerpt from that session, Nichols summarizes what might be the long-term costs of that mud in terms of cow and calf performance if adequate supplemental nutrition is not provided to compensate for the added cow energy requirements created by a muddy environment. So if we start to think about, okay, we've got this energetic cost, um, it's an increase in that energy requirements by 3.9 and 5.1 megacalories per day, how much feed would it cost to meet that? And this is a table I put together um, the beginning of this year, and I understand these feed costs are going to be a little outdated because my only option really was to take um, averages from 2016 to 2021, and that comes from USDA. But what I want you to focus on is just the amount to be fed, and this is just for the mature cows to meet that 3.9 megacalories per day, how much of several of these feed ingredients would I need to feed to, to hit that? So basically, if you're going to feed corn, you'd have to feed two and a half pounds per day to meet that extra 3.9 megacalories per day. And that's making the assumption that you are meeting her requirements up to that point. So in terms of, you know, we kind of preach on the beef team, forage test, um, understand your nutritional quality of your feeds. That's a, making that assumption that, yes, we are meeting her requirements besides that extra stressor of mud. So with corn, like I said, you need to feed about two and a half pounds per day. Alfalfa meal or an alfalfa cube would actually be almost five pounds per day you'd need to supplement. Corn gluten meal would be about two and a half pounds. Distiller's grains would only be about 2.3. Soybean meal would be 2.7 and corn gluten feed would be 2.6 pounds. And focusing more on what it would cost a supplement on a dollars per day, and this would be per head. So, you know, you'd have to multiply this by how many cows you've got. But the cheapest option would actually be corn gluten feed to, to supply that extra energy that that cow needs. And like I said, I put caution to this table because these feed costs are a little bit outdated and especially with what feed costs are right now, these are probably gonna be a little bit higher and may switch what, what would be the most economically advantageous to supplement. Um, so really just depends on what area you're in and what you have available to you, but just something you, to, you really need to put numbers to and think about when we when we see how big of an energy requirement that extra mud has on those cows. And a lot of people have asked, okay, so you you found yes, it increases net energy requirements pretty significantly, about forty percent in mature cows, and actually um, that increase in heifers is closer to fifty or fifty five percent of their net energy requirements per day. But you didn't see any differences in calf birth weight. You didn't see any differences in calf IDG. Um, growth up to weaning wasn't affected. So do I really need to supplement my cows? And what I caution, and this is making some assumptions, so I'll explain this. This is looking at conceptus free live weight, and this is in kilograms, so I apologize. But looking at days relative to calving, if we model that over several years, and what happens if you say, okay, I'm not going to supplement my cows this is also making the assumption that she never gains that body weight back and that we don't supplement, say, at weaning um, or that she doesn't gain any weight back in summer when hopefully we have some good, better grass, better forage. Um, this is making those assumptions. But if we, if we assume that you know, day zero would be calving, this solid black line would be that 550, so basically that 1,200 pounds of mature weight that she should be able to maintain if we're helping her meet those energy requirements. That would be a body condition score of a six. If we assume she hits that those last 70 days of gestation and decreases her body weight, like what we've seen on average in our cow study that we did um, back in 2020, that would put her down just a little over 500 kilograms, so about 1,000 pounds, a um, little over 1,000 pounds. That would drop her from a six to actually just below body condition score of a five and she would actually be a body condition score four, a high four. We make the assumption she maintains that body weight for the rest of the year. By the calving of year two, we hit late gestation. She's exposed to those muddy conditions again and she decreases her body weight again. 
she's actually dropping now from a body condition score before to a high three. Um, and if she does that again for a third consecutive year, she's actually dropping her body condition score to a two. So if we think about that from a reproduction standpoint, um, there's a study back in 1995 that is cited heavily where they looked at different body condition scores and what pregnancy rates they saw. And body condition scores of six by 60 days into the breeding season, 96% of those cows were pregnant. When they dropped that down to a body condition score five, pregnancy rate dropped to only 80% of those cows being pregnant. And then the lowest body condition score they looked at was a body condition score four, where only 56% of those cows were pregnant by day 60 of the breeding season. So my question and my caution is if we keep subjecting those cows to that body weight cycling, um, and I know this is a harsher example because like I said, they're not ever gaining that body weight back or even gaining some of that body weight back. My, my caution is if we keep subjecting those cows to that type of environmental stressor, we don't help her get through it either nutritionally or you know, look at other options like putting in a feed pad or some other way to get them out of mud is that after several years of this by maybe year three, maybe year four, we're gonna get into kind of a red zone where we decrease reproduction. We are probably gonna start seeing um, back in year two, we're gonna start seeing decreases in calf birth weight. We're gonna see consequences on colostrum quality and things like that that are really gonna get us into some issues from a cow, a cow just production standpoint, what we expect of those cows, but also some fetal programming effects that we didn't see um, in these studies, because those cows started in good condition, but if those cows don't start in as good a condition, I think we'll see a lot more detrimental consequences of that mud stress and late gestation. So the main conclusions from the studies that we've done over the last couple of years is again, that that energetic cost of mud to the mature beef cow is 3.9 megacalories per day, and that increases to 5.1 megacalories per day for the first calf heifer. As I kind of just hinted at, the cows and the heifers in our studies were in really good condition at the start. So we think they were in good enough condition. So body condition scores of you know, five to a six, and they were able to mobilize those body stores to provide for fetal growth. So um, I didn't put it in this presentation, but we um, ultrasounded for back fat, um, for rump fat, and did some plasma metabolites to see where was the, the mobilization coming from? Was it skeletal muscle? Was it just strictly fat mobilization? And we did have some confirmation that they were mobilizing their fat stores. Um, so it's pretty obvious that cows and heifers put fetal growth at the top of their list in terms of priorities for nutrient requirements, and they will mobilize whatever they can to provide for that fetal growth. As I just hinted out as well, though, while we didn't see any adverse effects on calf birth weight, I mentioned the calf IgG from the heifers. Um, or calf growth up to weaning in either of those studies, we really caution letting those cows and heifers decrease that conceptus free live weight during late gestation. And why I say that is going back to that last figure I just showed, where if we see um, conceptus free live weight losses year after year, or maybe those heifers never quite reach their mature weight, we, I really think we're going to start seeing a lot of negative um, effects in terms of reproduction, in terms of milk yield, calf growth, um, a lot of kind of alternative fetal programming effects that it can occur in utero if that cow doesn't have enough energy to fully develop that calf and develop important systems like, you know, the, the glucose and the insulin systems, things like that, that will affect calf efficiency and growth later on in the feedlot. I think we really need to avoid that or we will start seeing those negative effects. <clears throat> 